everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me and, and to uh, talk to you a little bit about some of the recent work that, that we've been doing. Um, so, uh, in the previous talk, uh, Professor Antonelli told something about how difficult it is to do quantum mechanics. Um, in fact, uh, the, the specific problem he was talking about was quantum mechanics of electrons. Uh, typically, all the other particles, the, the nuclei, are treated classically. So, in all these simulations that you've been seeing today, uh, like the, the, the nuclei are treated as classical particles, so you just use them using Newton's uh, equation of motion. But there are systems in which you're, you cannot do that. You cannot do that. Uh, even the nuclei have to be treated uh, quantum mechanically. And um, so specifically, I'm going to talk about a, a, a problem which, in which that's the case. Uh, and these are so-called quantum crystals. And I'll, I'll uh, uh, say a little bit more about what that is. And specifically, what we do is uh, try to learn something about fundamental mechanical behavior of uh, quantum crystals. So. Basically, most of the work was done by my, my grad student, uh, Edgar. He, he's now moved on and a postdoc at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and Professor Wade Kaiser, who is at Stanford. Um, so the first question is, what is a quantum crystal? Uh, so, well, two words here, so quantum and crystal. Crystal, probably everyone knows, it, it is a system uh, composed of uh, many particles, and you have some crystal order, so you have like an FCC lens or a diamond lens or whatever. Uh, but of course, this is not enough to, to, uh, to classify as a quantum crystal, because for that to be true, um, I need to use quantum mechanics and quantum statistics to describe it. So if I don't do that, I mean, uh, my description is, is useless in a way. Um, so what are the conditions that, that these two things are, are important? go into the details, but basically uh, quantum mechanics uh, associates wave-like behavior to particles, and uh, if the wavelength of this wave is comparable to interatomic particle distances, then you may get interference effects, and that's when, when um, quantum mechanics is important. This other point, quantum statistics, is what's involved when you have many identical particles in your system, um, and uh, there are some some restrictions that that come into play um, when you apply this, and this occurs when particles are allowed to exchange positions frequently. Okay, um, so the quantum substance I'm going to talk about, specific system in which uh, I need to treat these these effects quantum mechanically, is this uh, helium four. So uh, basically, this is really fundamental quantum condensed matter physics. It's not something like we're looking for applications technological applications. This is really fundamental uh, condensed matter physics. So helium-4 is very, a very interesting uh, substance. So what I'm plotting here is, is a phase diagram. So we have like temperature here, you have like pressure, you have all these different kinds of phases that you could have. So you have a gas phase at, uh, at relatively high temperature, you have a normal liquid, and then you have some other, other phases. So in 1937, three guys uh, independently discovered superfluidity in a liquid. So a liquid, uh, liquid helium. So basically what happens is you have, a, you have a normal liquid. What I mean by that is a liquid that has viscosity. That's something that we all know uh, and experience, viscosity of the liquid. Um, so then you start pulling it down, and about 2.17 degrees above absolute zero, there is a dramatic phase transition in which this liquid uh, turns into a superfluid. The superfluid is the phase of, of the helium-4 liquid that does not have any viscosity. So it flows without any uh, resistance. It's similar to what you have in superconductivity, in which you can have flowing without any dissipation. Right. Now, when you have that, you have all kinds of weird things. I, I can show you some movement going on. I don't have time to do that. Uh, but there are two effects that are really quite stunning. So what you see here is you have this, this recipient with superfluid helium in it, and basically because it doesn't have, doesn't have any viscosity, it's, it, it actually creeps up the walls and starts going down here and starts dropping through. So it defies gravity. The other thing is, I'm not sure if you can see very well here, but uh, so this is just a, 
a porous beaker, it's a porous material, if you have just normal, if you have the normal phase, this beaker just contains the helium, just like you have a glass of water. The glass will contain, uh, the water will, it will be able to hold the water. Now, if you cool it through this transition that becomes super fluid, it just starts leaking through. So it is as, as if you had a glass of water and your water starts leaking through the glass. So those are two very interesting and spectacular uh, phenomena of quantum mechanics on a macroscopic scale. Right? Now, uh, as you can see, this phase diagram has all, has all kinds of different phases. So I just talked about a liquid, and this is the superfluid phase. Now, if you start pressuring this thing, so you apply pressure, it eventually becomes a solid. Right? And uh, there was a question, well, could there be something like a solid, which is kind of a strange, strange concept if you think about it. Well, um, in 2004, these two guys uh, presented experiments in which that were interpreted as having superfluidity in a crystal. So, what? So, how should I think of that? What is that? I mean, superfluidity. In a crystal. Uh, so, let's see this thing. So basically the experiments that they did was you take a piece of solid and you do an experiment in which you do rotations. And what you measure is the frequency of oscillation as a function of the temperature, right? Now, they saw some, some sudden drop in the period in which they interpreted as if you have this rotation going on, the atoms are vibrating or are rotating along with the vibration. But when it becomes superfluid, atoms will be able to say, decouple from the rotation, right? So this, let's see if we can shoot this cartoon again. I can play this again. <coughs> so this is just an ordinary solid. Um, you see these atoms, they are basically rotating and vibrating along with this thing. Right? Now, when it becomes superfluid, that at least is the idea, you could have, say, atoms that just no longer go along with this vibration, and that's something you would measure in terms of the, of the vibrational period, right? So this, of course, was a big thing to a Nature and Science paper in 2004, and then uh, the years after that, lots and lots of experiments to try to, uh, to rationalize all this. Um, now, unfortunately, in 2012, the same two guys, or well, it was the same Chan and a different Kim, um, <laughs> They basically, they opened the door to the super solidity story and they also closed it down. Because basically they found out that the experiment, what they were observing in their experiments was elastic behavior, elasticity of, of solid behavior. Right? So what they were observing was really mechanical behavior. And that's um, uh, why many people are, are very interested now in the specific mechanical behavior of, of solid behavior. Now, um, so when I talk about mechanical behavior, typically I talk about elastic properties. So you have a solid, you just deform it a little bit. When you take away the force, it will go back to what it was originally. Or you can also talk about plasticity properties, which is uh, you just pull it a little bit harder, and when you remove the forces, the strains will not go away. It's just like taking a fork, and if you just bend it hard enough, it will not go back again. So that's plastic, plastic behavior. Um, and there's lots of sophisticated experiments on this, uh, both in terms of elastic properties and plastic properties. Now, the problem with this is um, they all need to be interpreted. There's no way you can actually really observe what's going on in this system. So there are no TENs of solid helium four, right? So everything needs to be interpreted, and you have to make assumptions on things to to uh, interpret your data. So you would like to have atomistic level information. And that's really not accessible experimentally in this case. Uh, and that's where atomistic modeling, all these stories you've heard this morning, are, uh, are actually uh, very helpful. Now, so what we need to do here is we need to do atomistic modeling. And we're looking at finite temperature helium-4. And we cannot do uh, MD. We cannot use DFD here. So the nuclei, the helium-4 atoms have to be treated quantum mechanically. And uh, the method to do that is, is called path integral Monte Carlo. Um, so essentially, 
uh, lots of details. So effectively what we do is we use Feynman's uh, formulation of quantum mechanics at finite temperature. Um, essentially you have a path integral representation of a thermal density matrix. Uh, just in a nutshell, a quantum particle is, in, in MD, a particle is basically just a point and the point moves along some, some trajectory with velocity or and uh, a position. Now, a quantum particle is actually represented by something like a closed polymer. So this thing uh, is an extended object which basically translates the fact that in quantum mechanics, uh, the position is uncertain and momentum is uncertain as well. Right? And these polymers interact with each other. So uh, computationally what we do is we take these paths that represent the particles and we sample the different geometries. Uh, we also do something like which is called permutation sampling, which has to do with the fact that the particles are instinctual and have to create uh, the quantum statistics. And we do ensemble averages. So basically it's using statistical mechanics of a quantum system at finite temperature. And uh, what we want to do here is use this kind of approach to learn something about mechanics, right? Because uh, as I mentioned before, mechanics is, is an interesting problem in the system. So specifically, what are we looking at? We look at something which is called ideal strength of, of HCP helium-4. HCP is this crystalline phase that you reach when you, from a superfluid you, you apply pressure and it becomes a crystal. So what is this ideal strength? Uh, it is a theoretical upper limit to the stress that a defect-free crystal, so you have a, 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 a crystal without any defects, uh, that can withstand before, uh, for a given loading mode. Uh, of course, it's an idealized concept because real crystals always contain defects, vacancies, dislocations, and whatnot. So in principle, uh, the real ideal strength limit is really an upper limit. A real crystal will yield before. Uh, but still, it is useful because it, it is an intrinsic material property and also it is a concept that's actually used in something like theory of fracture and homogeneous uh, defect nucleation. So, uh, effectively, what, what are we trying to do here is I just take a piece of material, a piece of my, or my, uh, my helium for the CP phase, uh, so this, this block of material like I represented, and what I want to do is look something like, uh, like a, like a stress-strain curve. So initially, I have, there's no strain, there's no deformation. Um, then I start applying a small, a small deformation, which will bring me to a linear portion of this stress-strain curve, which is this little linear elastic regime, uh, which means that if I would remove any stress, the system would just go back to what it was originally. Then I just increase a little bit more, so I'm going to walk along this curve, and at some point it's, it's going to start to bend off. Uh, still, it is elastic, but it's now non-linear elastic. So if you remove the stress, it will still move back. It will go back to the original state. Now, if I deform it a little bit more, at some point, the material will give. It will no longer be able to withstand the stress, and that's our ideal strength limit, which will give us the rupture. Right? So, uh, well, these are some simulation details are not very relevant. So actually, uh, some of the simulations this morning talk about millions of atoms. Now, if we can do something like 720, it's already uh, an enormous amount of computational effort. Right? Uh, and we look at uh, something like temperature of like 0.13 uh, Kelvin. Um, there is actually open source code that's available to do this. These are some other details concerning the model. Uh, so basically, this uh, uh, the model that actually describes the interaction between helium-4 atoms is this Aziz-95 model, which is a purely two-body uh, interaction, which was computed with, the, with these high-accuracy quantum chem uh, chemistry methods that are available nowadays. So um, this graph shows a typical result of a simulation that we do. So on the horizontal axis is the strain that I apply. So I just have a piece of material starting to deform it. And what I measure on the, on the vertical axis is the stress in the system, right? Now you can imagine if I apply like a strain like this, there is a stress moving back like that. And I can also have this other component on, on the different direction. So the red and blue curves measure these two stresses. So the red curve is the stress along the direction in which I do the deformation and the blue uh, is the stress which is perpendicular to that. 
So initially, so the curve that I see here is very, very much similar to what I had in this cartoon. So small strains, I have this like linear kind of behavior, and it starts to bend off, and then all of a sudden, boom, it drops down. So at this point, something is going on here. Uh, this is the limit of, uh, of, of rupture that I was mentioning. Interestingly, what you see is this other component was zero all the, along the way, and then all of a sudden at the rupture, something is developing there. So, of course, the question is, what's going on here? Uh, so, uh, then we actually look at these structures that we see with so polymers that represent our, our system. And effectively, uh, what's going on is, uh, if I look at the initial state here, which is perfect crystal, uh, if you look at the, this specific HCP structure, it's like a stacking of layers of A, B, A, B, A, B, right? And uh, that's exactly the structure to have, uh, have in, in the beginning. These C, the red ones here, the C stacking, is not occupied in this HCP structure, right? Now, what's going on after the rupture is two planes actually have shifted relative to each other, and this B, this B sequence actually went to this uh, unoccupied C stacking position that we had, which means that locally our HCP went to a different crystal structure, which is called FCC. And so what actually occurred here, this is, of course, this is a defect in the structure, and this is called a stacking fault. It's a fault in the stacking sequence of the crystal, and this thing uh, occurred by nucleation of such such a thing. So in terms of qualitative, in qualitative terms, we know what's going on is stacking fault nucleation. And this is actually not very different from what we have in classical crystals. Classical crystals are crystals in which you can treat the nuclei uh, classically just using ID. So. Now, next thing to do is how to quantify this, right? Uh, so again, we look at the same plot. Uh, so I can measure something which is something like a critical stress. Right? This is the value here is like seven bar or something, seven point something, and the other so which is called a critical stress, and this is something like a critical strain, which we call uh, the shear ability. Um, of course, what I'm doing is I'm applying like a shear strain in the plane, and in this case I applied it along a certain direction. But you can imagine if I just change the direction of the applied shear. Right? Is there an isotropy? Are there is one direction say uh, harder or harder to move than another one? Right? If you look at elasticity for this particular crystal structure, el elastically it's isotropic. It doesn't matter what direction; it's all the same. Right? So uh, this is oh, let's see. So what I'm plotting here on the right side is just a polar plot. So uh, the angle indicates the direction of the, the stress that I apply, and the radial axis is just the stress, the, the stress that, that you measure. And what you see here is this nice little hexagon, right, which is the pattern that we see. Now, this hexagon is exactly a structural pattern that you see in this crystal structure. So you see, for instance, at zero degrees, I have a relatively large stress. At 30, it's low. At 60, it's high again. And you can see that the high values are within the statistical uh, uncertainty. And the low values are also the same. So you have something like a hard direction, and you have like an easy direction. Now, if you look at the, at the left uh, side of the picture, you can see two atomic planes in this A, B, A, B sequence. And these easy directions, which are exactly these here, correspond to uh, directions that geometrically it's easy to, to, to slide one plane over the other. Right? Similarly, if you look at the other directions, the hard directions, those are the ones that exactly correspond to hard directions, whereas um, you have to push atoms against each other to actually uh, to move planes across each other. So this is just totally geometric. There is no quantum mechanics here. I mean, even for, for a quantum crystal, for a classical crystal, you expect exactly the same thing, right? Now, uh, this is some other detail. So, of course, the fact that this is exactly a hexagon uh, is really related to the, exa uh, the hexagonal structure. And the ratio of the large stress 
is geometrically determined. That's something that we would expect. And I'm not going to go into details, but when we actually compute those values, uh, so like the ratio of these two should be half squared of three, and what we get is 1.01 plus uh, 0.04 times this ratio. So this basically confirmed is totally geometric here. Apparently there is Now, the interesting thing is you can compare this ideal strength with other crystals. And there's lots of crystals, lots of crystals in which this is computed using DAT calculations. So these are crystals in which nuclei are so heavy that you can forget about one of them. Right? Uh, and this is actually taken from 2004. So you can see this plot. So this is the shearability versus the ideal strength. Uh, scaled by uh, the shear modulus. Shear modulus is basically the slope of this initial curve, right? And so you see uh, different symbols here. So the red, uh, the red uh, symbols correspond to something like semiconductor materials. The blue are metallic. Uh, different symbol types, so like a triangle or a circle, are different crystal structures. Right? And what you see is, that you see this line here, this line, this dashed line, is actually a line that's coming from a simplified model of ideal strength, which is, uh, is basically given by this relation. It's called the modified Frankel model. And the Frankel model is something that was developed in the uh, Again, details, but essentially what it is, is you can imagine you have like two atomic layers, that you're trying to shear with respect to each other. And of course, the crystals are periodic structures. So if you look at like the energy of this configuration with these two planes uh, shearing across each other, there's something, some potential uh, you know, surface like this is periodic. And um, so if you take this into account, you can measure something like a stress as a function of position. And the maximum stress that you, you can withstand basically that uh, comes down to this to this relation right? so that's you see this line is actually very very good fit even considering the fact that the electronic structure is so different crystal structure are all kinds of different crystal structures and everything is on this line and the model is really well I won't I won't call it trivial but it's very very simple all classical concepts no superfluidity no quantum mechanics here right? so the question is where is the helium in this plot, right? So we do the calculation, and it's right there, right? So it's on the lower end of this curve. Uh, this is a quantum crystal, so you cannot do anything like MD here or anything like it. And the conclusion here is that low temperature helium-4, which is just, just above the superfluid liquid phase in the phase diagram, it fits the universal behavior of classical solids. So that's actually a very surprising uh, conclusion, uh, not at all expected. Uh, and it is, in a way, a, uh, a manifestation of the fact that even being at such a low temperature that, uh, that the liquid phase is superfluid, which basically implies that the particles are totally indistinguishable. You cannot say this particle is here or that. In, if when you go to the crystalline phase, these effects are basically immediately they die down completely, and in a way it becomes almost partly classical. That's basically the, uh, what, uh, what we see here. Um, so that's basically the, the short story I wanted to to talk to you about. So uh, uh, so these Pantheon Monte Carlo simulations are a very powerful tool for the mechanics of quantum solids, not only for mechanics but other properties. So we're just using these, we're continuing to use these for, to look at other uh, mechanical elements in this system, in, 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 uh, including uh, defects such, such as dislocations and impurities. Um, now, low temperature condensed phase of helium-4 are strongly quantum, so you cannot treat this with MD at all. Uh, and yet, if you look at the ideal strength of, of ACP uh, helium-4 is very classical in the sense that the anisotropy is purely geometric is something that I would expect for any classical uh, crystal in the ACP phase 
And also, it fits very well this universal scaling behavior of, uh, of classical crystals. So that was basically it, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah. So, you, first of all, the interesting thing about helium, uh, helium 4 is in any other material, if you cool it down, at some point it will crystallize, even at zero pressure, right? In helium 4, it does not happen. You can go all the way, well, you can never reach zero, absolute zero, but it will always stay liquid. So, the quantum effect is there, so you need to apply pressure, and at some point, then the helium, the CP phase becomes lower in free energy, so then it's crystal. Um, but once all these atoms are basically located at their crystal positions, they no longer change, right? That's something that happens in the, in the liquid and does not happen in the crystal. So in that sense, you can say particles are almost distinguishable. You can say, okay, this is atom one and this is atom two, something you, you cannot do in, in a liquid, right? So that's, that's at least the interpretation of the very, very large difference between the behavior of the liquid, which is totally superfluid, right? And the crystal, which seems to be behaving in a classical way, even if the pressure difference is tiny, you're just on one side of the of the coexistence line, and you go on the other, the behavior is totally different. So uh, you had a strong uh, stress strain curve where you showed the shear stress versus the linear strain. And right. This what, one. Yeah. What is the stress measure you are using here? Is it quality stress or do or? What kind of stress are you using? This is, this is a thermodynamic stress, so it's a derivative of free energy with respect to cell shape. So it is true, true of thermodynamic stress. Um, there's maybe a question. Um, what if, although this helium, solid helium, and this is fully quantum behavior, but what if the properties that are related to this shear uh, in only involves quantum states that are obey very much uh, at a fast period, so that the behavior is is quantum, but it's it's classical like. Right, right. That that's well, we didn't check that, but probably that that's a, that's a very reasonable assumption in this case, because really exchange is not relevant. That, that's what this result tells us. Right. So probably that would be a, a reasonable approximation just to use the design. Mm -hmm. right. uh, I have my question is probably uh, arising from my ignorance about the, the, the theory, but uh, when we represent each atom as a polymer, with this representation, you can actually represent the non-locality of the atoms along the whole crystal structure, or you retain some kind of locality? Okay, so... Would you represent superfluidity, for yes, example? Yes, yes. So, uh, so I forgot to mention, of course, this, this computational approach actually can simulate the liquid superfluid phase. So essentially, what happens if the liquid becomes superfluid, these polymers, uh, you can... You can open them and you can start joining them in permutation cycles. So if, for instance, if you can do a very simple calculation of, say, you have a harmonic trap with, with, with bosons in it, uh, each particle is represented by a polymer, but you can start having these permutation cycles, which means that you can have, say, a hundred particles that are represented by a single closed polymer, which is much longer than a single particle. And that could happen, uh, could happen uh, spontaneously yes, it does, it does, it does. Because that's why you have to do permutation sampling. Uh, when you are in a condition like this, when this happens, these permutations start to be, start to be accepted, and this, you know, the, the, the length of these polymers starts growing in the resistance. So, so you have a collective sort of... Yes, so you have like a group of, of particles, atoms, that is represented by a single polymer. So you don't, you don't really know what, which particle is which, because they all are part of a single large polymer. Right. 
in that case, I have the impression that uh, you are observing a uh, phenomenon which seems quite classical because the atoms are somewhat localized in their wells of in the their crystalline right. periodic. Right. So, but actually, when we on, I, I think of the of, in a stress strain group that's performed with real polymers because I'm a chemist, I have done that in the lab. Right, right. So, one thing that happens is that when you reach the the, the the point, the what's the name? The ideal the, straight limit. The, the straight limit, the, the polymer <coughs> flows. The, the polymers start to flow one over the other because the, the, the chains become aligned. I, I, if if you, in your case you have a, you had a fully <coughs> velocity out of equilibrium, you could start to see uh, a faster uh, sliding of the of the of the crystalline uh, layers one over each other and, and, and then each atom would feel an average potential of the of the of the VCN of layers and then probably quantum effects would be would be more interesting. Well yeah. I mean I, I'm not saying that quantum effects are not here. I mean the quantum effects are certainly <coughs> in terms of zero coordination. I mean the particles are delocalized in about very much. Right? So Implicitly, quantum mechanics is there. I mean, the, the main difference, the spectacular difference with the liquid phase is that this, these exchange cycles are absent, which give rise to superfluidity. So uh, I think, it, I mean, the simulation, this, this uh, model approach, you map the, the quantum problem onto a classical problem of polymer. So it is, certainly it is, uh, similar to what, what you may have in polymer, but these polymers are all closed, right? So I guess what you have in real polymer is all the chains that are available. So in that sense, it is different. Another thing that I'd like to emphasize, there's no time. So what I do in a sense, there is no time. I mean, I'm not doing quantum dynamics. What I'm doing is I'm sampling from a, a quantum statistical ensemble and quasi-statically deforming it. Right? So it, it, there is no time. You are pushing on a Right, well, it's not, I mean, we're doing it at, at a finite rate, so there's no real temperature, but I mean, we, we slowly, you know, just change the box shape. The system is allowed to, to adjust to that, but we have to do it in finite time, because otherwise we'll never have to get to the, you know, to this, to this yeah. But probably the quantum dynamics of that. Okay, quantum dynamics, 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 I mean, this is all very hard. Yeah. Quantum dynamics are not even going, on, going <laughs> into that, right? Quantum dynamics is really hard. What's the difference of temperature? I'm sorry? Temperature. Oh, temperature. Yeah. Have you studied how the uh, temperature affects the uh, stress strain curve? And uh, yeah, yeah, so, let, let, so I, I think I even have a plot here at the end of the, end of the presentation, which I, didn't want, which I didn't show. Let's see where it is. So here. So this is a plot of the shear ability, so that's this, this strain that you can reach uh, as a function of temperature. Right? So at some, uh, of course we are at low temperature, below 0.5 Kelvin. Uh, basically, um, it is always a competition between, the, there are still thermal fluctuations, but we're trying to go to a low temperature in which these are as small as possible. So here we have a plot of shear ability as a function of temperature, so what you see is for high temperature, 2 Kelvin is high temperature in, our, in the system. So you see the shear ability, oh, shear ability goes down, right? So you have more thermal fluctuations. It will become easier for this thing to start, to start uh, shearing. And you go to lower temperature, and you see around 0.5. I mean, within the air bars, we, we, we can no longer distinguish from them, that they're different. So at this range, that's the one that I was talking about now, uh, we say thermal fluctuations are relatively important. What we're seeing here is really intrinsic quantum behavior. Uh, that's all.